Hi, I'm Matt Needham, and this is my lecture on Chapter 1 of the Uniform Mechanical Code. And uh, Chapter 1's title is Administration. What are some of the general principles of the Uniform Mechanical Code? Before we start, though, let's go over some terms that I wrote here on um, the whiteboard. Uh, first, we have this code. So when we, throughout the mechanical code, it's going to just say this code, and it means the uniform mechanical code because there's other codes. There's the plumbing code, there's the electrical code, and when you read those um, very exciting documents, uh, they would also say this code, but referring to their own um, code. And then here, also the abbreviation, be aware of AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction. Here in Los Angeles County, that would be um, Los Angeles Department um, of Building and Safety, uh, really the building inspector that comes out and checks everything in Los Angeles County. And then occupancy is the building's use, and they're usually abbreviated with a letter like for E is for educational buildings, B is for um, business, uh, uh, H is for high hazard, and so forth. There's a building use, and when you change the use, you now have to bring things up to uh, a new code. Um, expiration, when the permit has expired uh, or ended or died or needs to be renewed or they're not going to renew it or what have you. Um, retention, uh, like talking about building plans, you have to retain uh, the building plans on the site so that when the building inspector shows up, all he has to do is carry a little clipboard. Um, he may ha He's going to have available to him or at his office or whatever the plans, but you also have to have the plans at your work site so you can just show them up and roll them out and check it out. Unconstitutional is meaning not legal. We'll talk about that. The jurisdiction is like the area covered, which would be, let's say, Los Angeles County in, in our case. Um, and then ASHRAE is uh, used quite often, and it's a governing agency. The American Society of Heating, uh, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. So let's start here right at the beginning on uh, page one of Chapter one, again, talking about the title in general, they call the Uniform Mechanical Code this code. And then um, under the scope, the next point, the scope is um, the provisions of this code shall apply to the erection, installation, alteration, repair, relocation, replacement, addition, um, and to the maintenance of mechanical systems. Um, uh, and basically in the commentary talks about how this is going to affect the uh, environment. So this code is about generally heating, air conditioning, refrigeration, um, ventilation, uh, combustion. We're going to go over lectures on all of these things. And a big part of it is the safety of the person. Uh, the basic for all code it, it starts with safety so that the people in the property are first protected and that's really the idea behind most of the laws is that how can we create it for safety um, and uh, so that's the general idea uh, and then again for purpose it goes further about um, safety and health and welfare and it provides a minimum standard a minimum standard you can go beyond the standard if it says that uh, if you figure out that you need um, 5,000 cubic feet of fresh air every hour uh, into your zone and you provide 6,000, that's fine, but the minimum regulation will say is 5,000. Uh, my friend Chofi, um, when he built his house, he made things bigger and thicker uh, for the supporting the structure than was necessary. He went beyond the minimum. So it provides the minimum standards. Most people aren't really gonna spend the money to go over it, uh, but Chofi is Chofi. Okay. Um, now, uh, again, with the unconstitutional, what they're saying is if a part of the law, a part of the code is proven to be unconstitutional, um, illegal, 
um, it doesn't make the whole code invalid. And they actually write a law into the code to say that. Um, so that's what it's talking about there. And then uh, we have conflicts between codes. So sometimes you'll end up with two different statements in the code or some kind of conflict. And then they have a rule that the stricter one, the more stringent one, takes precedent. So that kind of like all tiebreakers go to the more difficult, the stricter, the safer um, law or code. Okay. Um, and then we have existing installations. Generally in, in law, in general, um, it's kind of like when the law was set, what was going on. So when a building is built, an old building, 100 years old, if nothing's been done to that building, it falls under the code of, 1920 or 1921, we'll say, and if you don't make any changes, it's under that code, uh, generally speaking. Um, so that's what they're saying is that, um, and you can't go back and then say, well, there's something new. Uh, for instance, in California, uh, when I was a little boy, Jerry Brown was governor for eight years, and then Maybe 10 years later, they pass a law saying you can only be governor for two terms or eight years. But that law came into effect after he had already been governor for eight years. So now here, uh, my late 40s, and uh, he became governor again for eight years because uh, the law went into effect after, and you can't go back and then... That's like a general legal principle. You can't go back uh, after a law is written and, and penalize somebody or a building or something from what happened before. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, now, the maintenance of the system, uh, of the mechanical systems that we deal with, is really the owner's responsibility. The owner of the building uh, is responsible for the safety of the equipment, the maintenance of it, make sure it's installed right. He's profiting from owning the equipment and the property. Therefore, he has the financial responsibility to make sure that it is maintained. Um, and again, here it mentions, uh, based on the authority having jurisdiction, which in Los Angeles case is e, the Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety. Um, on the next page, uh, it says here, additions, alterations, renovations, or repairs shall conform to, the, uh, to that required for a new system without requiring the existing mechanical system to be in accordance with uh, the requirements of this code. Now, in general, if you're just doing some little thing to a building, you don't have to bring the whole building up to code. There's some, for certain things like hospitals and schools, there are some different rules for that, but a little more, quite a bit more strict actually. But, you know, generally if you're just working on uh, one furnace or whatever for a small part of the building um, and you're gonna change that equipment out, like we do have this new law, it just came about in California, these low knocks furnaces, these furnaces that put out very low emissions, okay? And you might have a big home or whatever with a couple of the, of couple of old furnaces. If you change one, you've got to use this low emissions, um, high efficiency, bring in the air for combustion and out uh, with the new style low emissions. But if you had an older furnace at the other end of the building, it doesn't mean that you have to change that out right now uh, at this moment because you did the one you don't necessarily have to do the other at this time okay um okay and again here in this part of the lecture it mentions how ashray governs a lot of things the american society of heating refrigeration air conditioning engineers all right now you know we have this rule like if a building is built, like I said, in 1920, and no change is made. Now, the exception to that is if you have a change in occupancy. If somebody has like an old mansion 
and it doesn't seem very practical anymore and they think well I'm gonna make it a school you've now changed the occupancy from R from residential to E educational and this beautiful old mansion needs to be brought up to 2020 law or standards when you change occupancy and that's why a lot of times you won't see like something going to an office building or a restaurant or something like that because now you're changing occupancy and you have to and not just heating air conditioning refrigeration ventilation but the whole structure right that's kind of what in this chapter we're talking about some general things that affect everything all right um all right let's go to the next page uh now, the authority having jurisdiction, um, a building inspector, let's say for Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety, has the powers of a law enforcement officer. They're almost like a cop without a gun. You know what I mean? And if things get to the point where they need to gain access and they have an inspection warrant and you can't, they won't, like, you won't let them in, they get the sheriffs and they will get in. Um, and inspect your marijuana growing operation to see how legal it is or well I'm kidding but uh, something like that okay all right uh, and also the authority having jurisdiction I guess can deputize uh, deputize people to help out particularly like in an emergency here in earthquake country I don't know maybe you know they could deputize me like Barney Fife and uh, look for red tag buildings or something like that when you've got a hundred thousand devastated buildings they have the ability to deputize usually not just some code teacher or trade teacher like me but more likely it would be an inspector from another area from another part of the state preferably that could that you know how firefighters come from different parts when there's a massive fire and they'll help out well i guess it would be possible for building inspectors to come different parts of the state or even other states and be deputized to um, check things out let's say after an earthquake or some natural disaster okay um, here under liability now see building inspectors sometimes people you know if you don't mind just walking around with it and this this class actually let me just say this it can do a few for things for you, uh, specialized. You know, if you're really getting in involved in installation and uh, of new equipment, uh, if you're starting your own business, uh, knowing the code and helping you to pass that contractor's license test, this is certainly going to be helpful in that. Or if you want to be a building inspector someday and walk around with a clipboard and just ruin people's days, and that's what the point here is about liability is. You know, I mean, some inspectors are pretty cool, uh, and others may not be. Um, and um, even and building inspectors are human, and they make mistakes. And those mistakes could really cause people to be angry and cost them hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in some cases. And so then they write into the law a law that protects the building inspector, saying he's not personally liable, and that we will you know, the Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety is going to take care of this guy and we're going to get lawyers and you can't sue him as an individual, even though as an individual, he may be responsible for costing you a whole lot of money and time and grief and mental stress. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, the right to entry, um, again, uh, the building inspector can obtain, again, what we call an inspection warrant and go in with the sheriffs, uh, even if that means breaking down the door or whatever. They can also, you know, shut off power, um, utilities of, of any sort. Um, I was talking to somebody from LADWP and I was saying, like, what's your, what's your technique for shutting off the power for somebody? I was just curious. I didn't actually like that doesn't like has big fences up and barbed wire and and all of that um and you and they just won't pay their bill or the inspector says that they're using too much energy for their lighting for their plant growing or whatever and how do you do it 
and they said, well, they get these really long cutters, really long cutters, and they'll get access near the pole or on the pole or whatever, and they just reach up and will cut the wires going to that house for that time period. And uh, then there's an extra fee, they told me, on top of everything else, just to for that, if you end up having that need power back on, it doesn't matter how much money you show up with, there's gonna be an extra $300 fine on top of it because that had to be done and that has to be repaired, okay? All right. Um, now, things that are not under the code, things that are exempt work, gives us a short, short list here. Um, portable heating appliances, portable ventilating equipment, portable cooling and portable evaporative coolers that's not under the code i have a little portable evaporative cooler just outside a bedroom um that on dry days when it cools off at night i'll turn that on um and get some inexpensive humid cooling out of it um, but then in the winter time I, I i put it away now that just is on wheels or just sits there and can be removed or put back because it's generally when things aren't attached to the building part of the building, it's not under the code. And you'll see that. Um, and there's some questionable things that they kind of, like stoves, washer and dryers, those aren't really covered under the code either, okay? Um, now also things that it talks about here, it says a closed system of steam, hot or chilled water piping within heating or cooling equipment. Anything that's, even a package unit, or anything like that what they're saying is the package unit itself when the inspector comes um, how it attaches to the building its weight load its emissions um, uh, its electrical connection its condensate piping that goes off into a flower bed uh, how it is anchored to the building these are part of the code these are things that building inspectors look at now if it's already been ul approved underwriter laboratories i guess i could have put that up here underwriter laboratories what's going on inside isn't really of concern to the inspector in fact even though like you know obviously my whole background for my whole life uh since i was a teenager has been air conditioning refrigeration explaining you know, working in it, explaining how it works, refrigeration cycle of this, the whole air conditioning refrigeration trade. Now, a, some building inspectors that inspect air conditioning equipment don't really understand the deep aspects of how it works. Some of them may, some of them may be, you know, someone like me who, uh, as they got older, or they either went, I went more into teaching, maybe somebody puts the tools down and goes into being an inspector, which is not a bad thing. Um, but there are some people that just take the test that can say, well, it's not properly mounted or it, it's only so far away from something flammable. Uh, and this, and it's, they actually don't, in order to pass that test, you don't really need to understand the inner workings of the refrigeration cycle and, and superheat and subcooling and all of that, okay? Um, all right. Also, if you're saying a portable piece of equipment, um, it says does not exceed three horsepower and has been factory assembled and tested before its installation. Now, just like an old rule of thumb, when I was first coming up in the trade, my instructors taught me with air conditioning, refrigeration, that a one horsepower compressor uh, was uh, did about one ton of work. I don't think that's true anymore. I think things have gotten more efficient and it might be more like a one ton horsepower motor for that compressor might be like 1.2 tons, okay? So they're saying a three horsepower, so it might be more like three and a quarter, three and a half tons maximum that anything can be considered um, portable, okay? Uh, when you pull a permit, you have to indicate the use. Uh, is it a residence? Is it E for educational? Um, what is it? Okay. All right. Now let's uh, move on here to um, expiration. 
basically they have this 180 day rule that if you pull a permit and you don't start work for 180 days, the permit expires. Or if you do start work and then something happens, people run out of money, bad weather, you can't get the certain parts or whatever, and 180 days passes, the permit expires. Now they can, you can file paper and automatically generally get a 180 day um, extension and that's what the extension is about. So just kind of remember that 180 days, all right? Um, and again, retention of plans, uh, you have to have retention of plans, which means uh, on the job site so that the building inspector can just show up and look at the plans. You may have already submitted, you, you have submitted a set of plans to them, but you can't say, hey dude, didn't you bring your plans? They're gonna be like, ooh, let me mark, let me mark you off on all these things and make extra hard changes for your life. So uh, be aware that they just wanna be able to show up and roll out your plans without carrying around tons of plans to all the jobs they're gonna visit that day, okay? Um, all right. And then, uh, here, you can't, when you're doing a job, can totally conceal work, um, where the inspector can't get to it. Um, you have to leave it open and exposed, whether it's a ditch or whatever, so that they can look at it, a wall, maybe, uh, before the drywall is put up, there may be something they have to look at. Um, you can't just say, well, that's sealed up. You can trust me. It's, it's cool. It's code. They're going to say, rip that wall out, um, which isn't good. So just be aware of that. Um, all right. And then it's called a rough-in inspection when the inspector has to inspect something before the job is totally, totally done, which is called the final inspection. If an inspection has to be done midway through, that's called a rough in inspection, okay? Um, it's against the law if a building inspector has utilities shut off to go back behind them and turn them back on or wire around it or whatever. Now you're getting not only into fines, but you could actually get involved in, in uh, jail time, okay? Uh, and they do have the right to do a stop order. Generally, if there's just some little thing, it says seldom uh, does the authority jurisdiction do a stop order for permitted work that is found defective during the first inspection. They're going to say, well, you have a week to fix this or whatever. Um, instead of just like cease and desist, don't do anything. Um, okay. And then they usually have, when you pull a permit, um, mechanical fee permit, it's like they generally charge you a fee for, to cover the inspector's time um, for each piece of mechanical equipment, whether it's a furnace, a boiler, an air handler, or what have you. For each thing they have to inspect, there's a fee for that that adds up um, to the total. So um, before we finish, let's go over these terms again. This code Throughout this class, when we say this code, we mean the Uniform Mechanical Code. AHJ is the authority having jurisdiction. The occupancy is the building use. Uh, retention means that the plans are held at the site or retained at the site. Unconstitutional means not legal. Jurisdiction is the area covered. Let's say uh, Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety, Los Angeles County would be the jurisdiction. And then ASHRAE is American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. That ends my lecture on Chapter 1, Administration.